Hello, welcome to the Credits 2013 Hygiene Exam Candidate Orientation. The purpose of this exam is to offer a valid and objective assessment of your competency. Upon successful completion of this exam, you will have satisfied one of the requirements for obtaining your dental hygiene license. Currently, the Credits Hygiene Exam is accepted for licensure in approximately 40 different states. There will be no on-site candidate orientation. Instead, candidates are expected to view this orientation prior to their exam. If you have questions that are not addressed in this orientation, please email your questions to the address shown on this slide. While viewing this orientation, you'll probably find it helpful to have your candidate manual in front of you. The candidate manual has more detailed information than what we're going to provide here, and it should be used as your primary reference. If you've not yet heard from Central Office regarding your exam date and time, please be uh, patient and understand that confirmations are sent approximately two weeks after the exam deadline has passed. Candidates who are testing at their own site or their own school will receive uh, confirmation from their program director. And if you're testing at a different school than your own, you'll receive your confirmation directly from our Central Office via email. There will be somebody available at all exams to answer your questions. The Credits Hygiene Coordinator will serve as a liaison between the candidates, the test site coordinator, and the examiners. The Credits Hygiene Coordinator does not grade or score the candidate's clinical performance and will be present and available in the clinic area during the entire exam. If you have questions, you can direct them to the Hygiene Coordinator assigned to your exam. In addition to the Hygiene Coordinator, there will be a test site coordinator, somebody who is actually from the testing site who will be able to answer your questions that are specific to the school. You might have questions on emergency protocol or how to set up your equipment, the location of the bathrooms, those sorts of things, and the test site coordinator can answer those types of questions for you. On page 29 of your candidate manual, you'll find a checklist of items you'll need to bring with you on the day of your exam. Because of the requirement for anonymity, please don't bring anything with your school logo or name on it, including your radiographic mounts. Also, please remember to have your patient complete their health history and treatment consent forms before the day of the exam. Bring these completed forms with you to the exam, and if you need additional copies, you can make copies from the back of your candidate manual. Credits will be providing each candidate with a closable plastic container marked with their candidate number and a basic sterile instrument kit, which will include a mirror, probe, and explorer. These sterile instruments will initially be stored in the examiner's station and used by examiners during patient check-in, but will be returned to the candidate after patient check-in. Candidates can use the credits issued mirror, probe, and explorer, or any mirror, probe, or explorer of their own choice during their treatment time. When the patient is ready for final evaluation, candidates will need to send the credits issued mirror, probe, and explorer in the plastic container also provided by credits back to the examiner's evaluation station. At the completion of the exam, candidates will be allowed to keep the credits instruments and the container. For backup patients, there will be an ample supply of credits issued sterile instruments available as well. In short, examiners will be using these standardized credits instrument kits on all patients and candidates will be allowed to keep these instruments at the conclusion of the exam. As a reminder, candidates and patients are prohibited from having cell phones and all other types of electronic devices in the candidate clinic and the examiner's scoring areas. Disclosing solution and air abrasive polishing are also prohibited. All candidates must be present for the candidate check-in on the day of their exam. In order to receive an exam packet and be admitted to the exam, the candidate must present a government-issued photo ID. Candidates who do not have the required identification will not be admitted to the exam. When you check in, you'll receive your exam packet, which is actually a large manila envelope. Your exam packet will contain your identification badge, which must be worn during the entire exam, and several other materials and forms as shown here. One of the forms you'll find in your exam packet is titled Hygiene Treatment Selection Form. This form is a single-sided form and it will be printed on white paper. Please complete this form in blue ink.
let's review what you can expect on the day of your exam. After checking in and receiving your exam packet, you'll be allowed to enter the clinic, find your chair, and set your stuff down. Your unit will be set up and ready to receive a patient for immediate treatment. The reason for this is that we'll be asking all candidates in the previous group to set up their chair for the candidates in the next group. For candidates testing in the first group, we'll have asked assistance from the school to set the chair up. Once you've found your chair and set your stuff down, you can return to the patient reception area, get your patient, and seat them. At this time, you'll want to update your patient's health history, take their blood pressure, record any medications or pills, pre-medication they've taken within the last 24 hours. You'll complete your treatment selection form, and this will involve transferring information from your previously completed worksheets to the actual treatment selection form provided to you on the day of your exam. As soon as you've completed these things, you can escort your patient to the hygiene coordinator's desk and sign up for patient check-in. Your patient will likely be in the examiner's station for approximately 30 to 45 minutes. This means you'll have plenty of time to finish setting up your cubicle, your cavitron, and other instruments just the way you want them. A more detailed chart of the exam schedule can be found on page 11 of your manual. The times shown are examples of what you might expect for both morning and afternoon group assignments. As I mentioned previously, you'll need to bring your patient's completed health history and treatment consent form with you to the exam. Please review the requirements for health history on pages 18 through 20 of your manual and screen your patients for this exam carefully. Certain medical conditions would prohibit a patient from sitting for the exam and other medical conditions require medical clearance letters. When you bring your patient to the coordinator's desk for check-in, there's a number of things you'll need to bring with you. Because the list is rather long, we've actually published it on the front of your progress folder so you can refer to it before you bring your patient up for check-in. The progress folder is an important reminder document as it details the exam process and exam sequence. Please take time prior to your exam to read all three pages of the progress folder. Doing so will help you better prepare for this exam. Radiographs must be submitted with your patient at check-in and at final evaluation. All radiographs must meet the criteria listed in the manual. Radiographs must include your patient's name, the date the films were exposed, and your candidate number. Digital radiographs are acceptable as long as they meet the criteria listed in the manual. Criteria for patient acceptability and treatment selection requirements are listed on page 18 through 21 of your manual. Subgingival calculus must meet the definition of a qualifying deposit in order to be accepted. A qualifying deposit is defined as explorer-detectable subgingival calculus, which may exhibit such characteristics as a definite jump or bump, which is distinct and can be easily detected with an 11-12 explorer as it passes over the calculus. The two pictures shown here are intended to help demonstrate the difference between a qualifying surface of calculus and a non-qualifying surface of calculus. Please screen your patients carefully as examiners will deny any calculus that does not meet the definition of qualifying. The specific criteria and requirements for calculus and teeth can be found on pages 20 and 21 of your manual. The items listed on this page are prohibited from inclusion in your treatment submission. In other words, you should not submit any teeth in your treatment selection that contain these items. If you do so, your patient and your treatment selection would be rejected. Listed on this page are items that credit strongly discourages you from submitting in your treatment selection. These items create challenges for candidates that might put them at a disadvantage, and this is why we discourage their submission. Examiners will evaluate your treatment selection to determine if it is acceptable. If your treatment selection is accepted, the coordinator will record a start and finish time at the top of your progress folder. In addition, the teeth you submitted for treatment and the teeth assigned for pocket depth measurements will be recorded at the bottom of your progress folder. At this point, you may return with your patient to your cubicle and proceed with patient care. 
You will have two and a half hours to complete the required procedures, and you must have your patient signed up for final evaluation at the coordinator's desk on or before your assigned finish time to avoid penalties. If examiners determine that your treatment selection is unacceptable, the coordinator will still record a start-finish time on your progress folder, but the lower sections of the progress folder will be left blank. You will receive an Instructions to Candidate form, and you will have one hour from your start time to resubmit an acceptable treatment selection. If a candidate's first submission is deemed unacceptable, examiners will look to see if the candidate submitted an alternate submission. If they did, the candidate will be informed immediately that their first submission was unacceptable, but the patient will remain in the examiner's station while examiners continue to evaluate the candidate's alternate submission. If the candidate did not submit an alternate submission, the patient will be dismissed from the examiner's station and the candidate can resubmit the same or a different patient when they're ready to do so. If a candidate's first treatment selection is deemed unacceptable, they will receive a seven-point penalty. If their second treatment selection is deemed unacceptable, they will receive another seven-point penalty. There are no deductions for subsequent treatment selection submission, but your patient's treatment time would be diminished and the treatment selection deadline of one hour would be in effect. If anyone has a backup patient willing to sit for another candidate, please make the hygiene coordinator aware of this fact. Your backup patient will not be released to another candidate until you have an acceptable treatment selection yourself. All candidates should have sterile instruments available in case a backup patient is needed. Listed here are some possible reasons why a treatment selection would be deemed unacceptable. Insufficient qualifying calculus is the main reason treatment selections are deemed unacceptable. When screening your patients for this exam, please remember you are screening for surfaces of qualifying calculus, and if you use your worksheets properly, you should only chart those surfaces of calculus that you're certain meet the definition of qualifying. As for the other reasons listed here, candidates who do not understand the criteria or come to the exam unprepared often make errors that could easily have been prevented. Obviously, we cannot emphasize enough how important it is to read your candidate manual. As just mentioned, the worksheets provided in your manual are an important tool in helping you screen patients for this exam. On pages 44 and 45 are examples of completed full mouth screening worksheets. Use this worksheet first to chart all qualifying calculus in the patient's mouth. As a side note, we want to remind you that when you're screening patients for this exam, you must do it independently. Asking for assistance or an opinion from a faculty member, instructor, or other colleagues are strictly prohibited. Take a minute here to study the chart shown above. Assume this is a patient you screened yesterday as a potential board patient. Also assume you were very careful to only chart qualifying calculus. For instance, you explored and were able to detect subgingival calculus on all of the lingual surfaces of teeth 20 through 29, but you did not chart it because you were not confident that it really met the definition of qualifying. In other words, the only calculus you charted was very obvious. The type of calculus that clearly jumps when the explorer passes over it, or the type of calculus that binds and catches the explorer when it passes over. Given the calculus you charted, what six to ten teeth would you submit for treatment? Review the criteria carefully. Choose your teeth carefully and write down your selection. Decide on your initial treatment selection and then prepare an alternate treatment selection as well. Now, compare the teeth you selected with the teeth selected on the next slide. There is no one right answer to this exercise, but how did your selection compare to the one shown on this slide? Assume the eight teeth listed here are the teeth you chose to submit for your initial treatment selection, and you transferred the qualifying calculus from the whole mouth chart to this chart. Why did you choose this selection? Probably because you understand the criteria and you know that this submission meets and exceeds the minimum requirements. If examiners agree with your assessment, they will find 16 surfaces of qualifying calculus on posterior teeth, 
and two surfaces on anterior teeth for a total of 18 qualifying surfaces. This treatment selection comfortably exceeds the minimum requirements of having nine posterior surfaces, three of which must be on molars, and 14 total surfaces. Remember, examiners will not see your worksheets. What you think and what you charted is important, but ultimately it boils down to what three independent examiners think. Three examiners will independently chart the qualifying calculus on each tooth you submit for treatment. If two out of three examiners find qualifying calculus on a surface, it counts. You will not know, nor will you be told, where or how many surfaces of qualifying calculus the examiners found with regard to your treatment selection. In the example shown here, we will pretend the examiners found the same qualifying calculus you did, except they found qualifying surfaces of calculus on the lingual of 29, but found no qualifying calculus on the mesial surfaces of teeth 5 and 6. Would that treatment selection still qualify? Yes, because examiners ultimately found 16 surfaces on posterior teeth, 8 of which are on molars, and 17 total surfaces. After a treatment selection is deemed acceptable, 14 surfaces will be randomly chosen for a final evaluation. Again, the candidate will not know exactly which 14 surfaces have been selected for final evaluation, hence the requirement that all surfaces of all teeth submitted for treatment must be cleaned. Please remember to bring your completed worksheets with you to the exam. Here is an example showing how a candidate transferred information from their worksheet to their hygiene treatment selection form on the day of the exam. Also notice what this candidate submitted for their alternate submission. This candidate decided to keep the same eight teeth from their initial submission and then added teeth numbers 2 and 14 to their alternate submission. As we already know from the previous slides, this candidate's initial treatment submission was deemed acceptable, but if it had not been, it was the candidate's hope that these two additional teeth would have been enough to qualify the patient. Alternate submissions are designed to save time for candidates whose first submission is deemed unacceptable, and additional information and criteria for submitting an alternate submission can be found in your manual. Please refer to pages 23 through 26 for details on patient assessment. This section of your manual outlines the criteria for oral assessment, periodontal probing, subgingival calculus removal, and supragingival deposit removal. Candidates are expected to complete an extra and intraoral assessment on their patient. The extra oral assessment includes sections for the head, face, neck, lymph nodes, and TMJ. The intraoral assessment includes sections for mucosa alveolar ridge, palate oral pharynx, tongue, and floor of the mouth. Instructions on how to complete your oral assessment form are listed at the top of the form. Please review these instructions carefully. Also, for infection control purposes, there will be a plastic sheet protector included in your exam packet. After you have recorded your findings and you are ready to submit your patient for final evaluation, please insert your one-page oral assessment form into the plastic sheet protector. Here are some examples showing how a candidate might record their findings on their oral assessment form. These examples are meant to give you a general idea of how to correctly record your findings. Notice for section A on head, face, and neck, the candidate found no significant findings in this category, so they mark the within normal limits box. For section B on lymph nodes, they marked the tenderness box and recorded the location of the tenderness as requested on the form. And for section C on TMJ, they marked both right and left for audible palpable symptoms indicating this condition was bilateral. Here are some examples showing how a candidate might record their findings should a patient present with conditions as shown in these pictures. Notice how the lesion category requires candidates to record both a brief description and a location of the lesion. The other categories listed here only require the candidate to record a location. Again, here are more examples, except with these examples we are showing items listed for D referring to mucosa, lips, and alveolar ridge. 
This example shows how a candidate recorded two different lesions in Section D found on the same patient. Space is limited for recording your findings, but this is intentional. As instructed, your comments should be brief, and unless the circumstances are unusual, you should be able to contain your comments and findings to the space provided. These examples show how candidates correctly recorded their findings for Section F, Tongue, and G, Floor of Mouth. We hope you have found these pictures with examples provided in these last few slides helpful. The words and descriptors reviewed in these slides will likely vary from those you use on your form, as your patient and your conditions will be unique, but at least we have given you a general idea of what examiners are expecting. For periodontal probing, examiners will select four teeth for you to probe, and these four teeth will be assigned from the same teeth you submitted for treatment. The teeth you are assigned to probe will be listed on your progress folder, and then you will need to record your probe readings on the back of your oral assessment form. Here is a diagram showing where examiners will record the four teeth you are assigned to probe on the front of your progress folder and where you will record your probe readings for these teeth on the back of your oral assessment form. Of the four teeth you are expected to probe, examiners will choose two of the four teeth to evaluate at final evaluation. In the example shown here, the candidate forgot to record a reading for the mesial lingual pocket on tooth number three. If examiners were to choose this tooth for their final evaluation, such an omission on the candidate's part would be recorded as an error. For subgingival calculus removal, you will not know which 14 surfaces examiners have chosen to grade for final evaluation. Therefore, you are responsible for scaling all surfaces of all teeth submitted in your treatment selection. For supergingival deposit removal, the same criteria applies. The candidate is responsible for treating all teeth in their treatment selection. For tissue management, all intra and extra oral tissues will be evaluated. The candidate must effectively utilize sonic, ultrasonic, and hand instruments, polishing cups, and dental floss so that no unwarranted soft tissue trauma occurs as a result of the prophylaxis procedures. A tissue management critical error resulting in failure of the exam will be assessed if any of the following exist damage to four or more areas of gingival tissue, lips, or any oral mucosa located anywhere within or near the treatment selection, an amputated papilla, an exposure of the alveolar process, a laceration or damage that requires suturing or periopacking, an unreported broken instrument tip found in the sulcus, or one or more ultrasonic burns requiring follow-up treatment. Throughout the exam, not only clinical performance will be evaluated, but also the candidate's professional demeanor, patient management skills, and asepsis techniques. Penalties may be assessed for violation of exam standards as defined in the candidate manual for certain procedural errors as shown here. The penalties for submitting a patient late for final evaluation are severe, and candidates are reminded it is their responsibility to monitor their time carefully. Time penalties are strictly enforced, and no exceptions will be made for those who submit their patient late, even one minute late, for final evaluation. All patients sitting for the dental hygiene exam will have the opportunity to be anesthetized if the candidate or patient so desires. Please refer to pages 26 through 28 of your manual for details regarding administration of anesthetics. While not required, credits strongly encourages the use of local anesthetics. Patients that qualify to sit for this exam usually have significant deposits, and therefore a majority of all hygiene candidates do utilize local anesthesia during their patient care procedures. There are three options for candidates wishing to utilize an anesthetic for their patient during the exam. The technique and or the actual administration of the anesthetic will not be evaluated. However, all candidates who utilize anesthetic for their patients will be required to complete the appropriate record-keeping documentation. Candidates who administer their own anesthesia must receive authorization from the site dentist first and then must complete the documentation section prior to submitting their patient for final evaluation. 
If an anesthetic is administered and the candidate fails to complete the documentation section of this form, a two-point record-keeping penalty would be assessed. Candidates should follow CDC and testing site infection control guidelines and protocol, which include having the patient as well as the candidate wear safety glasses. Please make sure your credits issued instruments, your mirror, probe, and explore, are transported to the examiner station in the closable plastic container we provide for you. You can remove the patient bib prior to signing up for check-in and or final evaluation, as a new bib will be placed on the patient once they are seated in the scoring area. The examiners evaluating you will be state board members or experienced practitioners from credits member states. Observers who are dentists and or hygienists may also be present at your exam. Observers will wear an ID badge throughout the exam. They do not grade or assign scores, although they may examine patients as part of their observation process. The patient will be evaluated in the examiner's station by three independent examiners. This triple blind methodology means there's no communication between examiners during the grading process. On or before your assigned finish time, you must be signed up at the coordinator's desk for final evaluation to avoid time penalties. Be sure to leave enough time to review your progress folder, gather the items and instruments required for final evaluation, and escort your patient to the coordinator's desk. There will be a final evaluation sign-up sheet at the coordinator's desk on which you'll record your candidate number and your patient's name. You can then return to your unit and proceed to tear it down and set it up again for the next candidate. Once your cubicle is ready for the next candidate, please remove all your belongings from the clinic and wait in the patient reception area for your patient. Your patient will be returned to the reception area when the examiners have completed their final evaluation. After your patient is done with final evaluation, you can dismiss them. However, you cannot leave the exam until you have checked out with the hygiene coordinator. Listed on the progress folder are the items that you must turn in to the credits hygiene coordinator. Note that you need to return the materials in your original exam packet envelope, including your identification badge, progress folder, oral evaluation form, and the patient's health history and treatment consent forms. When you have turned in these items, you are free to leave the exam. Before closing, we have a couple hints you might find helpful. Please synchronize your own clock or watch with the designated official clock. It is important to recognize that this is a long day for both you and your patient. It is acceptable to give your patient a break if necessary. If your patient requires something to eat, please move out of the clinic and into the reception area. You should monitor your times carefully and balance your time with the needs of your patient. Please advise your patient that the examiners have been instructed to say very little to patients and this should not be misconstrued as rudeness. The examiners are focused on completing their evaluations thoroughly and accurately. Professional conduct is expected during the entire exam. Your attitude should be polite and professional. Please be considerate of your patient, other candidates and their patients, and all test site and credits personnel. The results of your exam will be mailed to you within three to four weeks after the exam. Candidates can also access their scores by logging on to the Candidate section of our Credits website. Please do not call the Credit Central Office for your scores. The staff is not authorized to release any results, and these types of interruptions only delay the process. The recommended passing score of this exam is 75 points. However, each state has its own licensing requirements, so it is recommended that candidates with concerns contact the state dental licensing agency where they wish to seek licensure. And that concludes our hygiene candidate orientation. We wish you success in this examination and your licensing process. Thank you.